What's on your mind, Father Mead? Holy baptism. What's that all about? You and I are attached to Christ not just by our own willing state of mind and wanting to follow Christ. By baptism, we are, this is a strong word, but I, I didn't make it up. We are incorporated as members of a body into Christ. Uh, St. Paul over and over again refers to being in Christ. He says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. Baptism confers that fresh start, that new birth. If Jesus is the one true, fully human being, when we are incorporated into Christ in baptism, we are brought into a mystery that allows us, little by little, to become more fully, perfectly human in Christ. Here's the difference between us and Jesus. I came to this many years ago when it dawned on me that Jesus is simple, clear, and deep. I, you, are complicated, muddled, and shallow. And as long as we wallow in our sin, we stay that way. I mean, it may become you know, variety is the spice of life, but it may be, it, it still is complicated, muddled, and shallow. But the more we are into Christ and are drawn into the mystery of what we have been given in baptism, that new birth, we become a little simpler, a little clearer, and deeper. And that's the pilgrimage that we, you know, that we, that we're on. We walk by the Spirit, but we're actually on a long journey, walking by the Spirit into Christ who takes us to the Father. Um, that's what life is all about. It's that pilgrimage. And as we get more and more into Christ, we put away our idolatries. Can I talk about idols and idolatry for a little bit? Knock yourself out. See, I believe that everybody, whether they are an atheist, an agnostic, a Christian, a believer or unbeliever, a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, Hindu, Buddhist, uh, animist, natural religions, all of us are religious in the sense that we have, we have an ultimate concern. Everyone has an ultimate concern or ultimate concerns which organize the way we live. We organize our lives around these ultimate concerns. And if our ultimate concerns are not the living God, what we are involved in is an idol, an idolatry. Now in the ancient world, they, they actually made idols. They still do <laughs> made idols. And the Psalms actually say, Eyes have they and see not, noses have they and smell not, ears have they and hear not, neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. Well, we do become like our ultimate concern, whether it's sex or gold or politics, you name it. We become like that. Let us instead become like the living God. And the good news about the living God, as we meandered about earlier, is that the living God has chosen to speak to us in our language, in our, own per, in our own flesh. The God who made the stardust has put on stardust, our human flesh, to address us in Jesus so that we, so that we know who God is and what God is like. And we also know who we are and what we could be like, what we were meant to be like in Christ. There's a great hymn, you may know it. Uh, we sometimes use it at Lent, Oh, for a Closer Walk with God, written by a very God-haunted poet, William Cooper, C-O-W-P-E-R, back in the 18th century. And he was a bit of a tormented soul about whether or not he really had faith or not, which makes me like him even more. 
In O for a Closer Walk with God, one of the stanzas is, the dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Now you're talking. Mm -hmm. that, that's strong stuff. And that is actually, he's put his finger on the journey, a closer walk with God. Um, we hope to do that in, in, in Lent, a little, a little practice. But that walk, presumably we peel away or knock down the dearest idols that we have, and we all have them. We have them. They get in the way. Our distractions, our superficialities, our vanities. But you know, life does have a way of, of knocking them down and making itself more simple at the, as we get closer and closer. A young, single parent woman, she was English, came to me with the most extraordinary request. She had a baby. She said, Father, I don't believe in God, but I want you to baptize this baby for me. I said, yes. And she said, you see, I was baptized in the Church of England. Uh, my parents loved me very much. I loved this little girl very much. And I want her to have everything that my parents gave me. Whether or not she becomes a Christian in the long term will be up to her. She said, maybe I'll believe in God again someday. I don't know. She said, I can't even give you godparents or sponsors. And I said, well, I'll find some. My wife, Nancy, was one of them. And we spoke up for that little baby. I cannot remember her name. It sounds like a story out of Thomas Hardy. Um, but it's a true story. And after checking with a few theological priest friends of mine, I'm quite sure that I was on the solid ground of Thomas Aquinas himself, who says that even a non-believer can baptize somebody in an extreme situation if that non-believer intends to do what the church does at baptism, even though he or she may not believe it themselves, because it's a why. This takes us back to the very first meandering we ever had, because of love because of charity, love is the answer. And so it seemed to me that the magic word was spoken by that woman when she said, because my parents loved me and I love this little girl and I want her to have what I had. Will you baptize her? But the thing about baptism, it has a lot to do with that scene in the Gospels that disturbs some people, you know, they bring little children to Jesus mm -hmm. and ask him to bless them, and he, and he does. And the, here are the disciples acting like the church so unattractively often looks, shooing them away. This is, this is for grown-ups. Oh, yeah? This is for grown-ups. And you know what Jesus does. He gets angry. And he says, let those children come to me. In fact, if you don't become like a little child, you'll never see or enter the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not saying that we have to become childish, mm -hmm. have temper tantrums. He's saying that we can take the love of God on trust. And the older we sinners get, the more complicated, muddled, mm -hmm. and shallow we get. I think the little child is not as muddled. I mean, that's not to say the child doesn't, isn't inclined by birth and environment and everything else. As Father Craig says, it's, some, it's kind of like being born into air pollution. Mm -hmm. That's one image I've heard him use, and it's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, yes, that's right, but nevertheless, the child hasn't, hasn't begun to activate uh, its predicament. Uh, and so Jesus says, let them come to me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. In fact, if you don't accept that the, 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 king, the, the, the kingdom as a little child, you'll never get into it. So I, I think my experience that it knocked me off my back on my heels with that woman was one of the most important experiences I've ever had in my life. Yes, love is the answer. I've been going through a little 
a trip down memory lane with Bob Dylan, who's one of my favorite. I think I'm so glad. I'm glad he won the Nobel Prize, and I'm glad he didn't go over there to receive it. It's just so Dylan, you know, and I don't think he was being contemptuous. I think he's an old man, and he's kind of tired. Maybe he didn't want to go through all the fawning and falderall. He has a song in Nashville Skyline which says, I threw it all away. You know it. Mm -hmm. You know it? Great album. Love and only love. It can't be denied. It makes the world go round. And um, actually, it does even more than make the world go round. It, it brought the world into existence. And the same God who loved the world so much, he gave his only son to the end that all who believe in him would not perish. And, and that's, the, that's the point of baptism. Baptism is that fresh start from this forced march that we've all been taking into the valley of the shadow of death. That's how I see baptism. And baptism, I think, I think baptism should, some of the clergy get really funny about baptism. Oh, well, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to jump through this hoop and that hoop, and if you're not coming to church and all of that, and the child isn't being raised in the faith, I understand that. I understand that, and I feel that way too, yes. But I also think in today's world, if somebody like that young woman passes through the obstacle course of this world to request holy baptism, that is an extremely significant event. And if you as a clergywoman or clergyman or whatever, if you haven't got the insight to see that, then you need glasses. And I've been like that. I mean, I'm talking as a recovering Pharisee myself. That's why I like St. Paul so much. I had some other things I'd written down here. No, I've oh, yes, 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 yes. A comment by Martin Luther. Not everybody's favorite theologian and Christian, but whatever else you can say about Martin Luther is he really got to the root of things many, many times in his e extraordinary life. And I think, I think if, you, if you wanted to pick out a person who changed the course of the world more than anybody in the last 1,000 years, he'd be in the top five. Mm -hmm. And he was a Christian and a sinner and he admitted both. When he would get really, really down, he would revive himself with this. But I'm baptized. Well, what does that mean? It means God put his hand on me mm -hmm. and I'm hanging on back for dear life just now. I haven't always, mm -hmm. but God's never let go. Okay, one baptism for the remission of sins. What about the human side of this? What happens when we fall away? Well, our prayer book provides for that. I mean, if you want to renew your baptism and you want to do it sacramentally, make a sacramental confession. We have that in the prayer book. There are five pages in here de devoted to it. it. It's a mainstay of my own life. I, I go to a, a priest about six times a year for it. I can't, I, God couldn't trust me to be a layman, so he made me a priest. And for me, that's a, that's a vital way of renewing my sense of the freshness of, of baptism into Christ, getting rid of the, taking out the trash, knocking down those idols, those habitual sins that become our best friends. In 12-step programs, they call those our character defects. <laughs> and what you're talking about is inventory. Oh, boy. Well, you know, those 12-step programs, I, I mean, I've... I've I've been privileged to be invited to, to some of them, and they're awesome. They're awesome, mm -hmm. and they're deeply uh, Christian in, in their shape, mm -hmm. uh, I think. As I was saying, The Dream of Gerontius is a long poem by John Henry Newman, a.k.a. Cardinal Newman, spent 45 years as an Anglican, 45 years as a, as a Roman Catholic, was canonized a saint recently by uh, Pope Francis. Yay! Anyway, uh, part of my thesis at Oxford was on him. Anyway, the dream of Gerontius, Gerontius means old man, is about the death of a rather average Catholic. The family calls for the priest to do the last rites, and it begins, Jesus, Maria, I am near to death. Well, the priest comes in the door and he starts, the, I mean, the last rites are in it, they're very short, and he starts the last rites. 
And as the prayers begin, the guardian angel arrives to take Gerontius' soul off to Jesus. Well, as he does so, oh, and it goes through all sorts of things. The great, some of the hymns we sing in the hymnal, um, uh, a praise to the holiest in the height, firmly I believe and truly. On he goes. Well, what happens is that he goes straight to Jesus, all right. And he can't bear the sight. It's so bright and brilliant, it blinds him. Why? Because he's complicated, muddled, and shallow. And Jesus is who he is. Simple, deep, and profound, and brilliant with the light of God. And Gerontius says to the angel, oh, please, please take me so I can heal my eyes. And he does. The angel takes him and he plunges him in these waters. Interesting, isn't it? Sounds like baptism? It is. He's already been baptized, but he's being renewed in his baptism. And we go through all of this in this poem. And I reckon he goes through all of these almost eons, purgatorial eons, as he's being prepared for the vision of Jesus. And finally, at the end, he reaches resolution and he's ready. He's ready for what we would call the beatific vision and the resurrection at the last day. And as you realize he's ready, all prepared, these long, long eons have been going by. The priest is just leaving the room. So it's a sleight of hand on time. The whole poem covers about a minute and a half of actual real time. But he's been going through world without end. Amen. Newman, through the genius of this poem, reconciled kind of the purgatorial eons of medieval Catholicism with evangelical, he'd been brought up in an evangelical faith and was co was complimented on it by uh, the guy who founded the Salvation Army and others about how what a, a good job he'd done. But I think that that tells us about baptism and what we've begun when we were baptized and what we're headed for at the end. And baptism provides the healing, all the gifts. You open the packet, you're going to spend your whole life opening that incredible package until we finally get there. And we said we started with love, that woman at Good Shepherd Rosemont who wanted her little girl baptized. You end with love because when we get there, our love will be purified. We wouldn't be happy otherwise because God is love. We will no longer need faith because faith will have become sight. We will no longer need hope because hope will have reached its destination. But we, we will still need love and we'll be home. That's how I see it. it. It confers full remission of what's the matter with us, but at the same time it consecrates to the point of enhancing to its potential perfection our humanity. Mm -hmm. We become, we're born again. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, it's, it's the flood that cover, it's related to Noah's flood, it covers the sin. It's the, it's the waters of deliverance. It's like the Red Sea. Why was Jesus baptized when he didn't need to be baptized? Because he was showing complete solidarity with sinners. He, it's like the cross. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that in him we might become God's justice and goodness. It's an incredible mystery. And, and it's the birth water. I mean, water is... All important as a symbol of death and life, isn't it? Baptism is almost, I mean, it, it's a physical act. It's a, it, it is a ritual. That's right. It's a state of mind. It doesn't stop you from being a petty, shallow, no pain in the ass. But it kind of, it, it's a lodestone almost. Yes, okay. it is. It is. It, yes, it is. It, it, uh, the other thing in the prayer book, and that the first sentence, it says that, Holy baptism is full initiation um, by water and the Spirit into Christ's body, the church. And then the next sentence says, the bond which God establishes in holy baptism is indissoluble. In other words, you can't erase it, no matter how far away you go. If you return to the church, you don't have to be baptized again. God didn't get funny. 
I'll tell you a story from Good Shepherd Rosemont again. And one is speaking of corporate baptism, one Easter vigil, I baptized an 84 year old man, a professor at Bryn Mawr College and classics, famous guy, Richmond Lattimore, translated Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and then went on later to translate most, if not all of the New Testament. He's a distinguished classic scholar. Um, he'd been brought up by missionary Quakers in China, he and his brother. Dr. Lattimore was never baptized. I didn't know that. All I knew is that he loved his wife, Alice, who was an exuberant high church woman and came to Good Shepherd week after week and was a great volunteer. She was a darling. And um, Dick would stay back. I never called him Dick. I always called him Dr. Lattimore. He would stay back at the back of the church. Well, one fine day, I mean, and uh, he, he once came to, uh, to Good Shepherd and gave a lecture on translating the Gospels, which he had just finished. And I remember he commented on St. Luke, how elegant Luke's Greek is. That Luke was a physician. He would have had, you know, Mark is not elegant. It's kind of rough. Um, John is simple, but Luke is elegant. So one fine day, I get the call that from Bryn Mawr Hospital, Dr. Lattimore has been taken to the hospital and he has cancer. So I go to visit him and I visit him several times. And finally, I think I'm gonna pop the question because I said to him, I said, you know, Dr. Lattimore, I would love to be able to give you communion, but I do understand that you have reservations. He's ne he'd never ever come up for communion. He said, he said uh, yes, he said, I did. I said, you did? He said, we, I said, do you no longer have reservations? He said, no. He said, I would love to receive communion, Andrew. He said, but um, you see, I can't. I said, why ever not? He said, I'm not baptized. I said, would you like to be baptized? He said, oh, very much. I said, well, I can baptize you right now, right here. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm not going to die just yet. He said, it's okay. Um, okay you'd like to be baptized? He said, yes. He said, I'm going to get out of the hospital. He, I said, well, it's early Lent. How'd you like to be baptized at the Easter vigil? Talk about the whole shebang. He said, that attracts me. <laughs> so long story short, we, I, I said, may I ask you, when did your reservations go away? He said, somewhere in St. Luke. So when we got there, little baby, Dr. Lattimore, church is packed. Not because of Dr. Lattimore, it was a well attended, the great vigil was well attended there. They were pretty exuberant people. We get to the part in the baptismal office where he said, do you believe in God the Father? You know, I believe in and the Apostles' Creed in question. He takes his prayer book and claps it closed. I thought, what's gonna happen? And he puts it on his breast, he closes his eyes and he looks up and he said, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, he went right through the whole creed like that. It was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. After he was baptized and received communion, he wanted to be confirmed. I presented him for confirmation and then the cancer came back a year later. And he said, I want this funeral service, Andy, to be kind of an evangelical outreach to the Bryn Mawr community. I want them all to know. Hmm. I said, may I tell this story? He said, that's why I'm telling you. So I told the story mm -hmm. with his permission. Baptism. Powerful stuff.